Okay, so we'll get started. All right, so let's get started here. So today we are going to uh, continue our discussion on web caching that we started last time. And then we'll also talk about uh, the, uh, the notion of edge computing and how uh, proxies can be generalized to this concept of uh, computing at the edge, okay? So I showed this picture last time. Okay, this is a picture you need to keep in mind for, for today's class. So you, you have on the first figure there, a traditional client server model for the web where you have clients that are web browsers accessing content that are stored on web servers. And then we have introduced an intermediary, which we'll refer to as a proxy server that sits between the client and the server, which gives us a client proxy server architecture. So in this case, clients are sending requests to proxies. Proxies can service that request directly if they have the resources or the content. And if not, they are going to essentially go to the server and uh, get the request processed. Okay, that's the picture you want to keep in mind. Okay, in our case, the service provided by the proxy is one of caching. Okay? So the proxy is caching content from the server. And when the browser makes a request, if the content is already in the cache, you return that content. Okay, otherwise, you will go to the web server. Same picture now uh, in a little more generalized way. Uh, uh, but also has one additional uh, concept of cooperative caching. So again, your clients, they send requests to their local proxy, the proxy services them from its cache, or it gets them from the web server if there is no content, if there's a cache miss, okay? What this picture is showing is that cache misses can be serviced by asking a local proxy, a nearby proxy rather than the server, okay? So, so in this case, if there's a miss at this proxy, you can ask, another proxy nearby is do you have the content? If so, you are going to still uh, hopefully get it faster than getting it from the server. Okay, so in this case, caches are cooperating with each other to service client requests. And what the clients see is the union of all the content that are stored in nearby caches rather than just the content uh, that is cached in the local proxy. Okay, so what we will with that background uh, or that refresher, what we'll do now is to talk about consistency issue. Okay, what can be done if the content that is cached in the proxy becomes stale, it's updated at the server, you can no longer serve that content to your users because they will see an outdated version of a web page and things of that sort, okay? So how do we deal with this problem? Okay, so as you can imagine, any web page or web content uh, tends to be updated dynamically over time. Okay, some page uh, web pages, once they're created are rarely or never updated, but others may be updated frequently. Okay, so the update frequency of web content will be different from one page to the other. Okay, so they could be a few minutes to a few weeks or, or almost never. Okay? So the question is how can the proxy maintain consistency of the content when different web pages change, uh, get updated at different frequencies? Okay? So we'll talk about uh, two approaches. One is a push-based approach that relies on the server. The other is a pull-based approach that relies on the uh, that relies on the pro uh, proxy. And then we'll also see that regardless of the approach, you can either tell the uh, notify the proxy that the web page has changed by sending an invalidate message, or you can send the new version of the page okay, so that the cache can be updated. So we'll talk about each of these issues next. Okay, so let's start with the push-based approach. Okay, in a, in a server push-based approach, it is the responsibility of the server to ensure that all the content that is stored at various proxy caches are never out of date. Okay, so what that means is for every web page that is stored at the server, it will keep a table that lists all the proxies that have a cached copy of that page. Okay, so you have a list saying here is index.html. You will have a list of proxies that are caching it. And you might have some other, like foo.html, you will have another list of proxies that cache it and so on. If any of those, if a page is updated, 
you look at that table and you find all the proxies that have a copy of the page and you notify the proxy saying the page has been updated the content you have in your this page that you cached in your local cache is now out of date so you, it should be deleted or removed from the uh, removed from the cache okay so so that is what it says here so prox server tracks all proxies that are requested objects if a web page is modified notify each proxy the notification can be of two types the simple thing is no invalidate that's what i just described where you simply inform the proxy that the web page has changed and have it discarded from the cache but you could also send the new version of the page okay you could say here is the new version of the page which automatically tells the proxy that the web page was changed and you can just now put that new page in your cache and delete the old page. Okay? so question is when would you send an invalidate from the server to the proxy when would you send an update okay and uh, there are of course pros and cons okay invalidate messages are short okay you just say yes the url this page is out of date okay an update would mean that you actually send the content itself which might be an entire html page it could be an image or any other content that is cached at the proxy okay so so one is small message the other is a large message now if the web if the content is popular at the proxy okay it makes sense to send an update because you might invalidate but then a request for that content is made by some other browser the proxy has to fetch it again from the server so you may as well just push the content to the server or to the proxy saying here is the new version okay on the other hand if the content is not popular okay you might just waste bandwidth by sending the new page and the proxy never has a request for that page subsequently okay so depending on the popularity of the page what is the read frequency access frequency of that content you can decide whether it makes sense to send an update which costs more or should you just send an invalidate which is cheap okay and then let the proxy decide if it wants to get the content at a future time okay so these are some trade offs that you will have to keep in mind as to when do you use okay, in the server push approach when would you use an invalidate message versus an update message for the content okay. any questions here okay okay so advantages of the push based approach the first advantage is it provides good consistency guarantees as soon as a web page is updated you are going to notify all the proxies because the proxies don't store stale content okay uh, the the content is only going to be stale for the duration of the time it takes for the message to go from the server to the proxy which is often small okay so tighter consistency guarantees minimum stale data minimal stale data proxies can be passive okay the, the intelligence is at the server proxies are dump caches they don't actually have to do anything the server will actually uh, inform them whenever the web page changes okay so it's passive proxies okay disadvantage of the approach okay, you have to keep the state at server okay here the state is for every web page you have to track all the proxies that have that all the caches that have that content so server becomes stateful okay if the server is going to crash okay and, and if you have kept the state in memory then that state will go away okay then you will not know okay so either you have to keep the state on disk so that you can keep the persist that state across server reboots and crashes or if you keep it in memory then you have to be willing to tolerate failures in some way okay so that's a problem okay it makes the server and a simple http server become stateful you might need mechanisms beyond http there is no real way to actually push content using http okay later on uh, beyond the original design of http new mechanisms have come in play like web sockets Okay, web sockets actually allow server to push information we are not going to cover web sockets in this class but uh, but if you just use pure http server doesn't speak anything any other protocol then this will have to be implemented using some other approach you can't just use http to push content http is a request response protocol you make a request get a response okay there's no way to push okay that's one issue the other issue is that the state may have to be kept indefinitely and might keep growing over time when do you stop sending an update or invalidate to a proxy you don't know when the proxy is no longer interested in that content okay, you might have to keep the state forever potentially which is going to be a problem because the state will just keep growing as more proxies get more web pages from the server okay 
Okay. So these are some pros and cons of the server push approach. Let's talk about the proxy pull approach. Okay. So in this case, it's the responsibility of the proxy to keep track of consistency issues. Okay. So what is the proxy going to do? Okay. The only thing it can do is every once in a while you ask the server saying, has this, I am caching a copy of this web page, has it changed? Okay. If the server says yes, you discard it from the cache. If the server says no, it hasn't changed, you can continue to keep it in the cache. Okay. This is called pooling. Okay. So you are essentially going to pull the server periodically asking if the web page has been modified. Okay. Now, interestingly, polling can be implemented using standard HTTP. You don't need any additional mechanism because uh, there is a way to use an HTTP GET request. You probably all know what get, HTTP GETs are because you implemented that in your lab. You're just using GET to get a web, web page. Okay. You can, there's a version of GET called a conditional GET. Okay. So you basically have a header in the GET called if modified since, and you can specify a date and a time. Okay. So you say get index.html if modified since something. You specify a date, right? April 1st, okay, noon. So what the server will do is it will actually check if the page was modified since the specified it and only then send the request. Okay, so this is a conditional way of getting. By default, a get always returns the content you request. This adds a condition. Only if the condition is true will the get res respond. Otherwise, it will say not changed. Okay. So if it says not change, you know that the page hasn't changed in the date you specify. Okay, so polling can be done just using these if modified since HTTP messages. No additional mechanism is needed. Okay. So it's very simple to implement using standard HTTP. Okay. Now the question for the proxy though is how frequently should you poll for a web page? Right? Because I already mentioned that different web pages are updated at different rates. Some might get updated once every few weeks and some are updated every few minutes. If it's a newspaper website, okay, then that web page has breaking news section and it might get updated frequently. Okay, if it is a personal website of, or a blog, you may not be updating it frequently. It may get updated few days, few weeks, few months, depending on how active that is. Right? So these things are going to be uh, very different. So you can't use one approach to say, I'm going to poll every minute. So if a web page is not modified for a few weeks, if you start sending a message every minute or every time it just server just says not modified, you're wasting a lot of bandwidth just asking for information that's not providing you any extra uh, uh, utility. Okay? So you have to control the polling rate and somehow tailor it to the update frequency. Okay, typically you don't know the update frequency. Okay, how is the proxy to know when a certain page is going to be modified. You're not going to know that, right? So, so there are heuristics that can be used. One of them is the server can assign or uh, uh, specify an optional time to live value with a page. Your time to live value says, okay, you can cache it for this much time. It might likely change after that TTL value expires. So you can say time to live is six hours. Okay? So that is a hint for the process, not a guarantee. It's a hint for the proxy saying, it is likely that the page might change after six hours. So you can, if time to live values are specified, then they could be used to decide the polling frequency. You poll after the TTL is going to expire. Okay? But that's not a guarantee. The web page might change before, okay? because just because a server assigned a time to live value, the server is not going to prevent a user from updating their web page. Right? So the web page might still change regardless of the uh, the hint that was provided, in which case you have stale content. Okay? So there are challenges in uh, the proxy-based approaches where how frequently to poll is not a clear uh, uh, information that the proxy has, and it has to figure this out in some way, and we'll see some techniques to do that. Okay, but before we do that, let's just talk about a few different ideas. Okay? So one approach is, that you somehow determine the polling frequency based on in, uh, just probing the server. Okay, so there's an approach called intelligent polling, which uh, dynamically determines the refresh interval. So you are going to what you are going to do is uh, for any page, 
when you first cache the page, you know no information about the page. Okay, so let's say you say I'm going to poll every minute. So you poll after one minute has passed. Okay, the server might say web page hasn't changed. Okay, if you say web page hasn't changed, you say the next polling time is now going to be two minutes, not one minute. So I increase it. Okay, the poll after two minutes. If it says not changed, then you increase it further. Okay, so you keep increasing it until you find a period of time when it says the server says okay the web page changed. So now you know how long it took for you to. Uh, for, before the web page change. Okay? So then you try to approximate that and use that frequency. Okay? And then you poll again. If you see that the web page has changed, maybe you shorten it a little bit saying, I may be polling too slowly. Okay? So you dynamically change the polling frequency okay, to understand that the average rate at which the web page is changing. Okay? So increase the interval if the object has not changed, decrease the interval if it changes between two polling frequency. So you are probing the server just by polling it at different period frequencies to figure out what is the right frequency. For web page has changed frequently, you will start figuring out that it is changing every few minutes or every hour, and you will start polling at that frequency. For web pages that are st relatively static, don't change, you will basically end up with a long polling frequency. Okay, and if the frequency of update changes, it will the, the system will adapt because it is going to keep shortening if or the interval if the web page has the changes between any two successive polling frequency. Okay? So this is a very simple heuristic okay, where the proxy has no a priori information about a web page, but just by polling at different rates, it can discover the update rate of a web page and poll for each web page at different rates depending on their update frequency. Okay? So this is an approach that can be used uh, to address some of what I mentioned on the previous slide, where you actually don't really know what is the right rate at which you pull off server. Okay. Yes, question? Okay, that's a good question. I was, so question is, can this change be done just as you uh, use congestion control techniques where you use something called AIMD? additive increase, multiplicative decrease to figure out what the congestion window is depending on network condition. So this idea was directly inspired by congestion control like techniques where you are probing the network to figure out in that case, the congestion window based on the loss rate and the bandwidth and so on. In this case, you are probing the server. So, so the rate at, so the way AIMD would matter is if you basically increase the window size in additive fashion and you decrease it in a multiplicative fashion. So you, you can do AIMD, you can do AID, you can increase linearly, decrease linearly. So the approach itself can be tailored based on how aggressively you want to increase or decrease. I think AIMD is a generally a good approach for techniques like this that are simply probing. Okay, congestion control uses these techniques frequently as well. Okay, that's a good observation. Your question is? Yes. What synchronization review? What do you mean? Oh, okay. Do we need to worry about clock? I heard blocks. So, okay. Do we need to worry about clock synchronization? So in this case, uh, you don't really need to worry too much about clock synchronization. You can assume that clocks use NTP, okay? uh, which gives you accuracies in tens of a millisecond or 100 milliseconds. That's good enough because it's web pages aren't going to change every 10 millisecond or anything like that, right? So you think about web content, few minutes, hours, days, that's the rate at which you might change some web page. So at that granularity, you don't need very precise clocks. You just need to make sure that the clock is synchronized okay, to some uh, good degree. And then you can use if modified since date and time to figure this out, okay? Any other questions? Okay. So that's intelligent polling, but now let's talk about uh, advantages and disadvantages. Advantage, as I said, is implementation is straightforward. You can just use standard HTTP and conditional gets. Okay, server remains stateless. Okay, remember in the push-based approach, you kept state at the server. Okay, in this case, the intelligence is at the proxy. Server is just an HTTP server. You're simply polling, and sometimes you're doing conditional gets rather than just standard gets. Okay. It's resilient to server and proxy failures. The proxy fails, what you have at most lost is the polling window that you've discovered. You can always restart at one minute and then keep increasing. 
right? So that's fine. It's not a big issue if, the, if you don't keep track of that information, okay? Disadvantage is that the consistency guarantee is going to be weaker than server push, okay? You will never know whether the web page has actually changed between two successive pulls. Because so you pull and then you're waiting for the next pull. The web page might change at the server. Okay, you will not know this until the next pull. Until then you have stale content in your server, I mean, your proxy. Okay? So there will be a period of time between two polls when the web page changes where the content is stale. Okay? In server push, this was not the case because as soon as it changed, the proxy was notified. In this case, there's no notification from the server. You have to pull and the next time and you will discover that the web page is stale. Okay? So, so that means that there'll be some time period for which you will have stale content in your uh, proxy. Okay. The only way you can do strong consistency with polling is if you actually poll after every request from a browser. The browser sends your request, you have cache it, you ask the server before you reply. Okay. But that defeats the purpose of actually putting the proxy because you wanted the cache to speed up your responses. If every response anyway requires you to go to a distant server, you may have as well gotten the content from the server because it didn't actually improve your latency. Okay. But that's the only way you can actually make it strong. So you will actually check before responding. Okay. So this requires more intelligence at the proxy. There could be high message overhead if the polling is not done intelligently. Right? If you're just using some very simple policy saying poll every fixed period, five minutes or something like that, some content will just uh, not change and you will poll frequently and waste network resources. Okay. So, so it could potentially have higher message overhead in the server push approach there's one message for every change. Every time a web page changes, server sends a message saying web page change. Okay, so it is optimal in terms of its message overhead. That's not going to be the case here necessarily. Okay, yes, your question. Uh, okay, keep going. Can we call Okay, question is uh, that pool-based approach does not have persistent HTTP connections and is that a limitation of this approach and a server push has persistent connection, right? So first of all, neither of these approaches requires persistent connections you can make it work with non-persistent connection. It is almost, if the polling frequency is less okay, or it's less frequent, it actually makes does not make sense to keep the pers connection persistent because you are wasting socket overheads or creating socket overhead and wasting socket resources at the server. Okay, only if you are going to poll very frequently does it make sense to make it persistent. You are polling every five hours to keep the connection alive that's wasting lots of network resources at the server. So, so it is not the case that you should actually use persistent connection. And that would be true even for server push. Okay. Why would the server keep a connection open to every proxy if a web page is changing every five days, right? Or every, like the, the, uh, the course web page gets updated twice a week when they put up the new slides, right? So, so the average update frequency is three and a half days. Okay. So would you keep a connection alive to wait for a message? It does not make sense. So, so I would not say necessarily that you should use persistent connection in either case. It only makes sense to do it when the content is changing frequently, when the messages go frequently. So you don't want to keep establishing connections. Okay, you had a question? Yes. Okay, is there a hybrid approach where push and pull would happen? There is one, we'll talk about it next. So you can understand how to combine the advantages, okay? Yes, okay, yes. All right, so let's talk now about hybrid approach, right? So, so pull has some advantages, push has some advantages, both have disadvantages. How can we try to get the best of both worlds? Okay, so that gets us to this hybrid approach that uses a combination of push and pull. Okay? And it is based on a concept called a lease which I'll first introduce, then I'll explain how the hybrid process works. Okay. So what is a lease? Okay. Lease is a general concept in distributed systems. Okay. Although here we are using it in the context of web proxy caching, 
you will see that leases are actually present as a mechanism in many types of distributed system. And this is the first time we have encountered it in this, in this class. So try to think of it as a more general concept than just for one that is used for web caching. Okay? So what does it mean? So as the name lease suggests, it's essentially a contract between two parties okay? where you agree on something. Okay? That's, what, so that's how you will do a lease for your apartment, rental and so on. So that's the same kind of concept. Okay? So in this context, uh, what a lease means is it's an agreement between a server and a proxy. It could be an agreement within a server and a client. Here it's between the server and the proxy for some duration of time. That's the lease duration. Okay? And here the agreement is that the server will guarantee that it will notify you that a web page has changed so long as you hold a valid lease. Okay? Once the lease expires, you will, the server will stop notifying. Okay? So this is now going to immediately address the disadvantage of server push where we said you have to keep state indefinitely. Okay? So what is going to happen in this case is that when the proxy makes a request for a web page, the server will send it the web page and it will also give it a lease on that web page. The lease says, let's say the lease duration is one hour. So lease says for the next one hour, if there are any changes to the web page, I, I will notify you. Okay? So, so long as the lease is valid, the server agrees to notify the proxy. When the lease expires, it's the job of the proxy to figure out should it renew the lease or let it lapse. Okay? If the page is an active user and it's seeing lots of requests from its user, it makes sense to renew the lease because you don't want to serve stale content. In that case, you will ask for a new lease and then the server will keep sending a notification. But if the page has expired, I mean, not expired, but rather is unpopular and not getting access, there is no reason to renew the lease because you are asking the server to send notification when no user is interested in that content. Okay? So the proxy can decide should it uh, get a new lease or not get the new lease. Okay? Now, uh, so that's the lease based approach. So how does this actually combine both uh, server push and client pull? It should be clear that a lease is a more limited form of server push because you are performing push for the duration of the lease only and so long as the lease is active. Okay? So you get all the advantages of the server push approach. You don't have to maintain state indefinitely because eventually some proxies will not renew the lease. So, so you just remove them from your list and so on. Okay? How does the proxy way pull approach come in? So assume, for, for example, that the lease duration is zero. So you get a lease, it immediately expires. Okay, the proxy will then essentially have to go back to the server next time a request comes and ask for a new lease. So essentially, it basically degenerates to polling. Okay? The lease duration is infinite. That translates to a pure server push approach. Server push approach is basically making the ser server send you notification for an infinite duration because there's no way to decide you stop sending notification. But if it goes closer to zero, it's the job of the proxy to keep asking for a new lease. And in doing so, it's also polling the server and getting no new content, right? So essentially, zero duration is degenerates to polling. So infinite duration is server push. But so anywhere in between is a combination where for the duration of the lease, you are essentially get, having server push. When it expires, you essentially go back to polling or pull, renewal of the lease. Okay? So that is how you are going to combine these advantages. And there's a picture here where the client requests a web page in the proxy. So you send HTTP GET request, you ask for a lease, you get the content as an HTTP reply, you get the lease, and then the server sends you invalidates or updates while the lease is active. When it expires, then it's a back to the proxy can either ask for a lease or just a poll if it needs to or whatever it needs to do. Okay, So this is going to combine these uh, two approaches and try to address some of these limitations. Okay? While the lease is active, consistency guarantees are going to be tight because the server is always going to notify. After the lease expires, if the proxy doesn't renew it, then you are back to your guarantees. Okay? So you're essentially going to have these uh, limitations and advantages as well. Okay. Now you can ask, okay, how long should the server give a lease for every object? Okay. There are many policies. Okay. One could be age-based. Okay. So age is basically the time since the last modification. Okay. Newer objects are ones that are either created or modified recently. 
Older objects are ones that have not been modified. It's like a new file and old file. Think about that concept. New file is the one that you might have created recently. Your old files are ones that were created long ago, never modified. Okay? So you can give age-based leases where newer files or shorter files can, uh, newer, uh, not files, newer content can have short, uh, uh, leases that are longer because you know this got updated recently. Older files might say, okay, there is not much update. So I'll give a short lease or you can decide if you want to renew it, but it's not getting changed frequently. Okay, so, so you can essentially vary the lease duration based on the age of the file. You can vary the lease duration based on the popularity of the file, independent of how frequently it changes. The content is popular. Okay, It makes sense to keep the content fresh at your proxies. Okay, So if there are lots of requests for some content, give longer leases and ensure that the, the page stays uh, current at all the proxies. Okay, so you can use popularity. Popularity can be measured as request rates. How many requests per second are you seeing for a specific web page? Okay. Based on that, you can change the lease duration, make it longer for more popular content. Okay, you can also uh, uh, use other metrics like the load on the server. The server is heavily loaded. You can start giving shorter leases and expire your leases. So the overhead of sending messages goes down. And if the server is less loaded, you can afford to keep longer leases and send more notifications because all of this adds over it. Consistency, maintenance, add over. So many different policies. There's no one answer on what's the right one to pick, et cetera. But you can decide based on the condition, uh, the, the criteria that the proxy is trying to achieve, which of these makes sense. Yes, question. So does the each proxy does on Yes, so question is, does each proxy have its own lease? Not only does each proxy have a lease, this is a lease for each web page at a proxy. If the proxy caches 100 different web pages, each of them will have a different lease because the web pages might come from different server or the same server. It's a cache of content, right? So you kind of fetch the content from any site. Okay. For every page, you have a lease. So it's not the lease per proxy, it's a lease per web page at a proxy. So different proxies will have different leases for the same page. Okay. So, so that is how you will actually, uh, that's how you have to think of it. Okay, question is, is it the proxy's responsibility to keep track of the lease or is it the server's responsibility? So in this case, because the hybrid approach, both parties have to be cognizant of the lease, okay? So the server has to keep track of all active leases and send notifications whenever the web page changes for every active lease, okay? So if you gave a lease for index.html to 10 proxies and there are 10 active leases, index.html is modified for every lease that you have on that object, you send a notification. Okay, so that is so the server has to track the leases, but the proxy has to as well, because if the lease expires, it's the proxy's job. Server is not going to tell you should you renew it or not. So it's like if you rented an apartment, you have to decide whether you want to renew your rental lease when it expires, right? So that's the same here. So when the lease expires, you have to say, should I renew it? So the proxy has to keep track of it as well. Right? So it's the both parties have to participate in this. Yes, question. Okay, so question is, do you need a separate monitoring framework to keep track of web uh, popularity of content and so on? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, so, so in some sense, the, you're right. So there are two things you can do. One is uh, the proxies can track the popularity of their web page and report some statistics to the server. So once you cache content at the proxy, the server actually does not know how popular the web page is because the proxies are absorbing a lot of the requests. Only the cache misses are coming to the server. So the server by itself will not know if the content is cached in many different proxies, how popular the content is. So it's up to the proxies to figure this information and somehow aggregate it and report it to the server. Okay? That's one approach that you can do. And that has to go on top of whatever we talked about because otherwise the server doesn't know the popularity. If you have popularity-based leases, 
that's a metric you have to collect age and server load their server side statistics so that the server can know so you are right in that there will be some types of policies that will require some information from the proxies to figure out what the lease duration should be and that monitoring framework can be some uh, added on to the proxy system it's not part of the lease approach okay All right okay so the last point that i want to make on caching before we move to edge computing is this notion of cooperative caching i already alluded it to this earlier where i said when a proxy gets a request if that content is not cached at the proxy it's a cache miss you have to get that content and then respond to your browser okay. normally you would go to the server and get the content and put it in the cache and get uh, send it to the server but you could also ask a nearby proxy rather than going to the server if you do that you have a set of proxies that are cooperating with each other in addition to interacting with all the web servers to serve user request okay so so this is referred to as cooperative caching okay? so you have essentially now an overlay network of caches that all talk to each other okay this overlay network has evolved to what people call cdns and content distribution networks which also we'll talk about in a short while okay but for now just assume that there are a collection of proxies that cooperate with each other and answer client requests so how is this cooperative caching going to work so here is a picture that shows how it works so so we will assume that you have these caches that are shown in the gray boxes okay and we'll further assume there is a hierarchy okay so we'll here there are three caches that are leaf and there is a parent prox, uh, cache that is essentially one level up so you can think of a tree structure okay where you have all these proxy caches okay? and at the very top you have a server there could be many of them but only one is shown each client is going to always send its request to the local cache so when the cache receives a request is going to be either a hit or a miss it's a hit if the content is cached if it's a miss is the content is not cached hits are very easy you are just going to reply directly the okay, question is what do you do when you get a miss okay. so in this approach we'll see that you actually ask all of your peers if they have the content before you go to the server okay so here is a picture so you now have a read okay read is a http get it's called a read but it's a get that's gone to the local cache okay so if it's a miss you essentially send request to your parent and all your peers saying do you have this message okay this message is titled icp that stands for internet cache protocol okay which is essentially caching protocol that allows you to request content from other caches like http but only operating on cache okay so so your icp messages that go let's say that you get responses back okay so your response is yes or a no i either have the object or don't have the object okay if it is a yes then you are going to go to one of the caches and get it if it's a no then you send it to a parent saying resolve okay so in this case you essentially say forwarded that http request to the parent if there is a two level hierarchy that would repeat at the next level and so on okay in this case it's just that's already the root of your cache so that is going to send an http request to the server server will respond then the content will flow down and you'll send that content back to the client okay so so this is how cooperation is going to work okay this works well when a nearby proxy actually has the content okay if there is what is called a global miss which means no one in the system has this content you are just making lots of queries you send it to all your peers it then you go to the next tier next tier can repeat until you go all the way to the server and the content is flowing down okay in the meantime the user is sitting there waiting for their web page to load okay and you can imagine that a global miss is going to increase the latency that the user sees significantly Okay, because it would have probably been much faster for this client to just send a simple HTTP request to the server and get the content, right? Because that would have been faster than all of this querying that is going on, and then the entire cache says, "Oh, there is no no one has this web page. Let's get it from the server." Okay, so the advantage of cooperative caching is that if the content is actually cached at some other nearby proxy. it is still faster than going to a distant server so if it was actually at a nearby proxy you could have gotten it and responded faster 
but when the content is not cached at all, that is the slow case. That is when user will see large latency increase. And we want to address that problem. Okay, because cooperative caching is good in many other regards, but when your global misses, this type of approach will be very slow. Okay, so what, what can you think of that will improve this approach for a global miss? The only thing we care about is how we don't want to have that overhead of asking everyone. Everyone says no, then you go to the survey. Okay, so you have a super peer approach where we'll keep track of some information. That's one idea. Did you have something else to say? Okay, so the other approach is you can limit this by making maybe two requests, you ask maybe two levels, and then you go to the server. That will limit the latency of a global mix, right? So both of these ideas are actually valid approaches to reduce the latency. Uh, but there is another even simpler idea, which is that every proxy keeps a table of all the content that is stored in its nearby caches. Okay? So the proxy knows what content it has cached. So it has all a list of all the items in its cache. Why can't it keep track of what is stored at local caches? Okay? So then what you do is when a content request comes in, you basically do a table lookup. Do I have it? Does somebody else nearby have it? If the answer is no, in the table, you just go to the server and get it, you're done. Okay, if the table says no, there is the content is actually at a nearby cache, you just go there and fetch it. Okay, that is this very simple approach where now there is no hierarchy. It's just a flat network of proxies, right? So essentially you have a key value store which says for every content, what is the list of proxies that have it? So AX says that content A is at node X, which is proxy X, right? So in this case, lookup is local. In the previous case, you actually sent ICP messages waited for response. Here you reduce that to a table lookup. Instead of asking, you already have a table of what is there at every nearby proxy. So you are going to just do a lookup, table lookup. Okay. Hit is at most two hops, okay, because either the hit is local, which is one hop, but then if you have to go somewhere else, you'll get it from there. Okay. So that's two hops. Okay. Miss can also be at most two ops. If there is a global miss, the table says no one has it, you just go get it from the server, that's done. Okay. But you might have a case where you have a table that says X has it, so you go to X to get it, but X actually doesn't have it. Maybe the server sent it an invalidated message and said web page change, discard it. But the table has yet to be updated okay, because you have to keep the table consistent. So maybe you made a mistake, but that's okay. You just sent it one, direction, then you can go ahead from go to the server and get it. So in the worst case, MISC will also be two hops, but in most cases, it will be just one hop. Okay. So now you're sped up your lookups, you're sped up your misses, and you're still cooperating. Right? So you don't have to get all the extra overhead, so that just all goes away. Okay. So adding the simple extra information makes this faster. And the only thing now you have to do is to make sure this table is always up to date, which means when a proxy gets a new web page, it has to inform all of its nearby peers saying, I got this web page, add this entry to your table. Saying, say, now I have page X. Okay, so you have to keep, or conversely, when you delete a page because it's, it's out of date or you just decided to do a cache replacement, you also have to inform the proxy saying, I removed it from my web page. Okay, so, so there is an additional overhead of keeping these tables uh, directories essentially consistent. Okay, so but so long as you do that, the, the performance of your system will get much better than the previous approach. Okay. Okay, so that is cooperative caching. Okay, so now you this animation here saying you do a read, you go to node X, okay, and then you get the content, you're done. Okay, and then here is another read where you go look it up, it's not anywhere in the system because the, the table says no one has it, you get it from the server, again you're done. Okay, so these are the two cases where you have a local a remote hit, which is a hit at a nearby proxy or a global miss. Okay. So with that, we are going to change gears and switch to your question. Yes.
Yeah. Okay. Question is, can you, uh, in the server push approach, or maybe even the leases approach, use a multicast based approach to notify all the props? That's your question, right? Yes. So, so that's right. Uh, I should have mentioned that the notifications can be sent either as n unicast messages, one to each proxy that has the content, or it can be sent as a single multicast message where all the proxies are listening. Okay. So that is a more efficient way of sending notifications. So that can certainly be done. I think that is orthogonal to whether you use a lease or not use a lease. Okay. The question is, if you do a multicast, you don't require a lease. And so that's what you're saying. So the reason you require a lease is if you don't have a list of which proxies to notify, if you are sending an update message to every proxy in the system, okay, maybe only 10 proxies have con this content. You have wasted messages and sent it to 10,000 proxies that don't need that message. Even though it's a multicast message, you are still using network resources to send that message, right? So you want to send if you use multicast, you want to only send it to the proxy group that has that content, not to every proxy in the world, right? So that's the, uh, the reason you still want to track that, right? If you had a small number of proxies, maybe you could always send all messages to all proxies, but what if the number of proxy caches is large and on most of the proxies are not caching a web page, then why would you get all these extraneous messages? So that's the issue you want to deal with, yes, question. Okay, question is, uh, if you wanted to do multicast, how would you identify proxies that actually have that content, right? So you would have to construct a multicast group for every web page, okay? And when a proxy caches that content, you have to put that proxy in that group, okay? And if you remove that content, you have to remove it from the group, right? So, so it's not a network multicast address as much as just a logical address where the group membership depends on the table that says, this page is, is cached at n different proxies. So you put them in. So every web page will need its own multicast group. It could be an application level multicast yeah, as opposed to a network level multicast. But nevertheless, you have to construct that group in order to multicast it to the right subset of proxies. And that has to be tailored on a page basis. Right? So, but I mean, you can also send unicast messages, but that's one way you can make it a little more efficient. You don't have to send n messages, you send one message. Okay, yes, question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, if you have this hierarchical proxy caching system, can different proxies use different consistency mechanisms, some push, some pull? So I think that would certainly be a problem because uh, you want to have some uniform way of maintaining consistency. I mean, if they're totally independent caches that don't talk to each other, Right. You deploy a cache. So, so there are open source systems like Squid. You can just download this. You can deploy a cache on your machine and you tell your browser to go there. It will start caching content, but that proxy cache doesn't talk to anything else. So then you can use whatever consistency you want there. It is independent of other. But when you have a set of caches that are interacting with each other, it is better to use a uniform consistency mechanism so that you don't have stale content somewhere and another cache has only fresh content and things of that sort. Okay, so moving on. All right, so the next topic is edge computing. Okay, this is not a new topic because this is essentially the evolution of proxy servers into a more general approach where you deploy servers at the edge of the network and they provide a service. Okay? In our proxy caching case, 
your service was they were these proxies are caching web content but that's not the only service you can provide okay you can essentially run actual applications on servers you can do whatever you do on any cloud server okay so this notion of deploying proxies close to clients at the edge of the network has evolved to a more general concept called edge computing okay so edge computing is basically a paradigm where applications run on servers that are at the edge of the network okay so you can say what does it give you why would you do this okay the idea is very similar to web proxy caching where if you cache content closer to users you can reduce latency the same is true here okay R rather than sending requests to a remote server you are sending your request or work to a nearby server so you can get your work done at lower network latency okay the network latency to go to an edge server is lower than a network latency maybe to go to a cloud server so you can get your responses faster than going to a remote cloud server in many cases you will actually also benefit from higher bandwidth because the bandwidth between the client and the nearby server may potentially be higher than going on the public internet to a remote server where there may be more congested links to the network okay so you may often get some benefit of higher bandwidth as well and last the benefit is rather than relying on cloud servers if you rely on edge servers if there are network outages in the network or there are issues with the cloud your edge system is still remains accessible okay so several advantages okay we are going to mostly focus on the first one which is the low latency advantage because that is the really the important one that has made edge computing popular okay now i will say one thing before we uh, jump into edge computing is the way cloud computing uh, platform see this is a simply an extension to cloud computing okay many cloud providers also provide edge servers so you can say rather than get a, getting an server in a cloud region you can ask for a server in the edge region it looks exactly like a normal cloud server except that it is closer to wherever you are probably as a user than something in a far off region okay so so cloud platforms are treating edge computing as an extension where resources cloud resources are being deployed closer to users rather than in far off data centers okay so the way this is actually coming becoming uh, viable is actually through cloud computing but it has some distinct differences from cloud computing namely its lower latency and higher bandwidth and so on okay but uh, before we talk about how it is used today it makes sense to understand why, how this field actually evolved okay so the field has simultaneously evolved from two different areas okay mobile computing and web caching so the way we already talked about web proxies and web caching so what happened is uh, as, as web caching became popular there were several commercial providers that decided to offer proxy caching as a service where they deployed proxy caches in many different networks okay and if you are a operator of a website or a web application you could ask for caching you could become a customer of this company and they would cache your content for you and deliver it to your end users okay so you now pay your caching provider a small fee just as you would know, you would probably pay your cloud provider a fee to run something on your server okay so many companies provided caching as a commercial service to operators of busy website okay and these companies essentially deployed what were called content delivery networks which was simply a large network of proxy caches that deployed in many cases all over the world okay and you could then essentially offload your content onto these caches and then they get delivered at low latency to end users okay so this network of caches essentially was a form of early form of edge computing where you deployed all of these caches and now you're delivering content eventually the content became richer you could de deploy simple web applications at that not just simple web content you could probably put a simple web server and have it do some computations and things of that sort so the servers were used for more than web caching they started developing some abilities to perform computations for users as well okay and uh, in many cases they were used for delivering rich content like images and streaming video streaming became a popular way to uh, deliver content from the edge okay because you have streaming services that's a lots and lots of users 
you comp you uh, replicate this video content at the edge and if somebody wants to stream uh, your favorite tv show or movies it is coming from a nearby edge server rather than going to a cloud and and this is where some of the bandwidth benefits come in because if you're delivering it from a far off server if there is congestion in the network you will see essentially your video will pause there's buffering and so on but if you're delivering it from the edge there are fewer network hops to the client so probability of a problem on the network is lower and there's higher bandwidth okay so so content delivery networks became popular evolved into edge computing okay but at the same time the area of mobile computing had similar evolution of edge computing okay so if you think about early mobile devices phones and other kinds of devices even laptops they were resource constrained okay they didn't have as much capability as larger server they were often battery powered so they were energy constrained as well okay so it was not advisable to do heavy duty computation on mobile devices that had limited resources and limited battery power so one approach that mobile computing researchers came up with is that let's put some servers close to the edge of my wireless network okay my mobile device will then essentially offload work rather than doing the computation locally it will offload work to that edge server it will do the work for for that mobile device and send back results okay this was called computation offloading offloading computations from one device to another device in this case it was a mobile device to an edge server okay presumably the edge server was more powerful it was a standard pc or a standard server it was running on ac power so there's no energy constraints unlike running things on a phone where you essentially run down your battery because you did a lot of computation so you could do more heavy duty computations or you could have mobile applications that did more heavy duty computations even though the devices themselves were resource constrained okay so this approach essentially also led to edge computing where you are doing low latency offload to nearby servers and uh, essentially run interactive web uh, application and the edge server would run that computation and send you results okay this so even today uh this approach is used for things like augmented reality and virtual reality so so you can have phones or your headsets which don't have that much uh, local computation they are just offloading computation to a nearby server the server is sending results okay? that's essentially mobile edge computing okay so both of these fields led to evolution of edge computing but for different reasons in one case you wanted to deliver content faster okay from a cache in another case your edge end client didn't have enough resources so it was leveraging the nearby server resources to do its work okay but both of them actually led to this notion of edge computing so with that background i will talk about each of these in a little more detail we'll talk about cdns first mobile edge computing next and then we'll end with how edge computing is used today okay? so let's talk a little bit about content delivery networks so as i mentioned a cdn is essentially a global network of edge proxies okay that are providing caching services maybe other services but let's only focus on caching to deliver web content okay typically it's used useful to deliver rich content heavy images video content which can increase the load on the server significantly okay lightweight html pages is not really the use case because that you can send from the server Okay, but if you're sending large images or you're sending lots of video streams, servers can get overloaded. It's better to cache that content and deliver it from the caches. That will also reduce the load on the server while reducing latency that the users see. Okay, commercial CDNs essentially deploy lots of these servers in many different networks. Okay, so the Akamai CDN, Akamai is a company that provides CDN service. It's one of the largest CDNs. anywhere so they have more than 100000 servers deployed in 80 different countries okay these uh, servers are deployed as clusters of different sizes okay some clusters may be only two servers or five servers in larger cities you may have clusters of uh, several hundred servers because you have to cache more content there are more users so they are deployed as edge proxies of in clusters of different sizes depending on the demand in each of those networks Okay, and then you can then essentially get uh, your content delivered from the CDN. Okay, so in this case, content providers or website owners are the customers for the CDN. 
end clients just access content. They are not paying the CDN to access content. Okay, so it's the content provider that is essentially the customer. They are caching their content in CDN proxies and paying for that service to deliver that content. Okay, so there are new sites, image rich online stores, putting product catalogs in CDNs is a very popular use case. Okay, so you have lots of images for your product, you just deliver them from your uh, edges, edge proxies, streaming sites, you make heavy use of CDNs and so on. Okay, and since content providers are using CDNs, they get to decide what to cache. Okay, so you control what, if you have a website, let's say it has uh, HTML pages and it has images, you decide what is cached and what is stored on the original server. Okay, if you want to deliver something from your edge proxy, you essentially embed a link in your web page that points you to the CDN. So instead of saying get foo.jpg from this side, you actually embed a URL that says cdn.com foo.jpg. So it will basically, the browser will automatically load that from a CDN as opposed to going to the server. Okay? So you can embed this links and make the web browser get some content of the page from the CDN, other content from the website, and you can control that because you write the HTML in the page. Okay. And it's consistency is now responsibility of the content provider. Okay. All of what we talked about push, pull, not needed because if the content provider updates the page, simplest thing is you change the URL, you change the file name. You update an image, you change it, and then the, the CDN will con, uh, cache the new content of the uh, new version of the image and so on. Okay. Whatever it is, it's up to the uh, content provider that when they update the page, they have to make sure that anything that has been cached is also either invalidated or updated or new versions are set. Okay, so the CDN does not necessarily do any consistency in this case. Okay, so it's simplified version of what we talked about from a consistency perspective. Okay, and users are just going to use browsers to access their websites. Normally, transparently, the browser is just fetching some content from a web uh, from a CDN. Okay, you don't actually see this happening because it is all embedded in an HTML page and you just get the content from wherever it's pointing. Okay. So one of the things that the CDNs do is because they have lots of different servers, when a request comes in, the CDN has to decide which proxy is going to serve that request. Okay. Maybe popular content is stored on thousands of servers in the network of a CDN. A user from Amherst makes a request, which of those thousand servers would you use to deliver that content? Okay. The idea is you want to send the request to the nearest server. Okay. The nearest server to somebody, someone in Amherst is not the nearest server for somebody in New York or somebody in California or somebody in a different country. So the request for the same content is sent to different proxies depending on the location of the user. Okay. The nearest server is based on where the user is based. There is no one nearest server for all users. Okay? So the CDN has to implement some techniques to figure out for every request that is coming in, where is the actual user based and what is the closest proxy for that user so that you send the request. Okay? That's called request routing. Okay? You route the request to the right proxy so that you get it at the lowest latency. You send it to a far off proxy, you did not get, give good performance to the user because they could have gone to the server and gotten it. And the whole point of Edge was that you deliver it at low latency, the content. Okay. So how do uh, CDNs do this? So they have large load balancers that look at requests that are coming in and they send it to different proxies. Okay. And typical CDNs will have a two level load balancer. There's a global level of load balancing which says for every request, which cluster should I send it to? So you send it to the nearest cluster. Okay? And there's a local level of load balancing that says once a request is mapped to a cluster, which server or which cache of that cluster will actually service that request because the cluster may itself have several hundred servers or it may have two servers, but you have to figure out. So you map first the request to a cluster in a location and then the second level mapping says which server in that cluster. Okay, So that's global and local the load balancing. Okay. But regardless of that, the big question is how do you decide what is the closest server or the closest cluster? Okay. So that is done by CDNs using a special type of domain name service okay, or DNS. 
Okay, I don't know if you know what DNS is. We didn't actually cover that in this class this time. But a DNS is a service that takes a URL or a name and gives you the IP address. Okay, so if you say www.umas.edu, the DNS system will translate that to an IP address, and your browser will then make a connection to that IP address. Okay, so it's res resolving names to IP addresses. Okay. Now what? Uh, DNS is used by CDNs do is they have special algorithms that will change the IP address that is returned to the client based on the location of the client. Okay. So suppose you say, I want to go to CNN.com. Okay. So your browser is first going to do a DNS lookup okay, because it has to translate CNN.com to an IP address. If that website is actually now stored on a CDN, that DNS server that's going to resolve it will become is the DNS server of the CDN itself. Okay? So your request to uh, uh, DNS request is going to go to the CDN. The CDN will say, where did this request come from? Because the, your client will send that request, it will have the client IP address. Okay? So it will use that IP address of the client to do what is called geolocationing or try to figure out where is that user based. Okay? This is similar to how your phone says you are at this location or things of that sort, right? So if you say, I mean, uh, the, the DNS says this user is in Amherst, then it will say, what servers do I have in the proxy network that are close to Amherst? Okay? And it will pick one of those servers and then it will resolve the IP address to one of those servers. Okay? So, and if the same request for that same content came from another location, that DNS will say, that user is in New York. So there's a different server close to New York. So it will now give a different IP address. So then that browser will connect to that IP address to get the same page, whereas the user in Amherst will connect to a nearby proxy to get that page. Okay? So you are using DNS-based resolution to send client requests transparently okay, to the proxy that is closest to the user. Okay, you have a question? Okay, question is, uh, do edge server proxies, do they use pro cooperative caching? In this case, you don't need to do cooperative caching. You are essentially going to replicate the content. Okay? And then this local load balancing will make sure that the server you get mapped to already has the content. Okay? And if it doesn't have it, then the, uh, the, the pro CDN will fetch it in the background, but then it will just go to the origin server and get it. Okay. So typically you shouldn't have to do that because the DNS should send you to a proxy that already has the content, right? So, so the table that we saw in the second part of cooperative caching, think of that table is already at the DNS server. So it's already sending you to a proxy, not just the nearest proxy, it's sending you to the nearest proxy that has the content. So you shouldn't have a miss to begin with. Okay. So you can keep all of that information in the DNS. So you always get sent to some uh, uh, proxy server that has a copy of your content. Question is, are DNS and CDN independent services? In this case, the DNS is actually run by the CDN server. So what happens is you will, your browser will send a request to a local DNS that is probably run in this case by UMass. Okay? That doesn't know any of this, but that DNS server will actually send that request to an, another server that is responsible for that domain that you're going after, maybe cnn.com. At CNN would, in this case, have the CDN run its DNS service for it. And so then you go to the CDN and that is where all of this is going to happen. Okay? So DNS is indeed separate from CDNs, but some DNS servers in this case are going to be run by the CDN and those are the servers for domains that it is actually caching content for. Okay, so you have a more intelligent version of the DNS. Okay, your question, yes. Well, so question is, is there other criteria other than geographical proximity that you will use to do this load balancing? Uh, the, it is indeed the case. In fact, there will be dozens of papers on what are the criteria is the best because uh, there you could say load on the server. Why send it to the nearest server? If it's overloaded, send it to the second nearest server. Maybe the link is down. Maybe the nodes have failed. 
So there will be all kinds of things that will happen. So the proxies will go down as well, right? So fault tolerance has to be built in. You can't just send it blindly to the nearest server. What if the network is down, right? So it, it has to be transparently sent to another server so user doesn't even see this outage. There are all kinds of criteria you will use to do request routing. I just explained the simplest one saying you send it to the nearest one, but that's not always the right criteria. In fact, it will have a lot more sophistication than that. Any other questions? Okay, so that is request routing. Okay, so uh, we already mentioned all of this. So we will ignore this. So you are asking about multicast. So you can actually send some notifications as multicast, but typically it's the, or the, the job of the content provider to ensure that content is fresh. Okay, so that's the main thing to keep in mind. Here's a picture which uh, explains what I said. I'll go through this quickly. Okay, so here is the client. Okay. That's the DNS server okay, of the CDN. That's the proxy server. Okay. That's the actual website. Okay. That's your regular DNS. So first you want to get the document, you go to the origin server, you get an HTML content. Okay. It has embedded links, which presumably point to the CDN. So all the images maybe come from the CDN, the text HTML comes from the server. So now to get those images, they are pointing to some CDN server. So you will go to your regular DNS. Okay, that is going to send that request here to the CDN server's uh, DNS. So that CDN server's DNS will say, where is this client? Okay, based on the location of the client, you'll pick one server. In this case, that's the server. You typically send it to a cluster and then you'll do a second level. Here it's only showing one uh, for simplicity. So you'll send it there and then you'll get the content. Okay, so that's the request flow that you have to keep in mind. And if there is a miss there, you will see that if you don't have the content, the first time the request goes, the CDN doesn't have the content, you'll see it will get it and put it in the cache. Okay, so that cache misses are also handled in this way. Okay, so let's just skip this. Okay, so this slide is simply saying that CDNs have now evolved from simple caches to running entire applications at the edge. Okay, so you can run an entire website with all the code because today's web uh, applications are not simple uh, website HTTP servers that are serving static HTML page. Okay? They are microservices that are generating the content on the fly and so on. Right. So, so in many cases, if you are dynamically generated content, it's fundamentally not cacheable, and most of the content that's coming from websites are not static HTML pages. They are pages that generate that are generated on the fly. This is what you did in your lab. That all the content that came from your service was generated on the fly. Right? It was not something that was stored as an HTML page on some disk somewhere. Okay? So all dynamic content by de definition is not cacheable because you can generate it differently. Okay? So in this case, caches are less useful for CDNs unless you're delivering things like video content as static, but otherwise you can't, uh, you can only cache images and uh, things like that, but not actual content like HTML pages. So what CDNs have started doing is they are allowing you to run your entire web application on the edge. So you can still give low latency. You're not using this as a cache, but you're simply using this as a server to run code. Okay, so instead of running your microservices or multi-tier applications on a cloud server, you essentially run them at the edge. Okay. So this is essentially the origins of edge computing where proxy caches essentially became full-fledged servers that started running code. Okay. And now that is what all edge computing services do. You can run arbitrary code in virtual machine, but this is how CDNs got there and the cloud also, start, cloud computing also started doing the same thing. Okay. So very quickly, uh, mobile edge computing I already talked about. It allows mobile devices to offload compute intensive tasks to edge uh, servers. Okay? So this was the other evolution of edge computing from the mobile computing world rather than the world of web. Okay? So common use cases are mobile AR and VR, augmented reality, virtual reality, where the mobile device is processing graphics heavy content. Okay? That will drain your battery life faster and you need heavy duty computation to render, right? So many of these lower devices may not have that kind of capability. So they will send the request to a nearby PC or server. It will do the computation and send results and you just display it. Okay. 
So that was essentially a use case where phones, headset that had limited resources, battery life, essentially started offloading this content. The most important thing here was you needed low latency because the users are interacting with this system. Right? If you're wearing a headset to play a virtual reality game, and if you move your head, you want the thing, the, the screen to move. If it takes a while because you are sending the request to far off server, the user performance will or experience will degrade. So you want very low latency responses, which means that the edge server has to be near to the user. Okay? And in many cases, your device may not have a GPU and so on, so but the uh, edge server will have. Okay? So that was the original motivation for doing mobile offload. Okay? Now today's phones are very different from phones of 10 years ago. Okay? You buy a phone, it has four core processors. It has a mobile GPU. It may even have neural engine to do machine learning tasks. So the need to offload from smartphones has reduced because phones have become a lot more capable. They are faster than PCs were five, 10 years ago. Okay. But that doesn't mean that this is no longer useful because there are all other kinds of devices that are now where phones were 10 years ago. Your headset is not going to have a four core processor and a mobile GPU necessarily. If it does, it will become bulky and heavy and whatnot. So, so if you want lightweight mobile devices, it will have less resources, so you will still have to do offload. So, so the need for offloading has moved away from phones to other kinds of devices. And the other thing that uh, has made this useful is cellular providers are starting to put proxies and edge servers near their cell towers. Okay? So you can then have not phones, but all other kinds of devices, uh, internet of thing devices, autonomous cars, industrial machines that are just offloading computations to proxies that are actually located as cell towers and so on. Okay, so that's another way this edge computing has actually evolved. Okay, so we are a bit over time. So let's just talk about uh, this last couple of slides next time. Okay, so we'll stop here.